Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Monday morning trading room. One second here. We'll get the screen share going on. I hope everyone had a nice, relaxing weekend. <laughs> what is it? Weekends always seem so short. <laughs> the work week seems so long, and weekends seem so short. What's up with that? All right. Well, uh, let's see kind of where we're at, where we've been, where we're at. Uh, Friday session, a very, very strong rally day right into the close. Uh, the pre-market relatively quiet, although we uh, are opening with a little bit of a gap to the upside. That's different for us. For the last few weeks, the gaps have all been underneath. So this is the first bearish gap that we've seen, a gap actually above the market. We'll see whether that puts any pressure on the buyers today or whether they're just going to shrug it off and keep pushing the market higher from here. You can see we're getting a few early signals here. The Hawk producing a first micro macro cross lower. The Raptor also producing a trend change signal. That's the cloud crossover signal. We're right here at the bottom of this trading range. Go ahead if you want to try it, but I think you're probably going to want to look to enter below those lows or maybe even look for a second push entry. The problem, of course, with entering below these lows is there's been obvious buying going on here. So this is not, you know, the best scenario for getting into a trade. Did they slip me? Yeah, look at that. And then they slipped me a couple of ticks too. So I'll show you how that works out. Uh, we might get some early direction here. So that's the upshot with trying to get into the market early. You may catch some of that early momentum, but uh, getting slipped a couple ticks, that's a little unusual for the NASDAQ. Hit our break even trigger. It looks like we should find our profit target and hooray for us. Hooray for me. I don't usually do those early trades. So it's nice to see one of those work out. And it looks like the market's going to try to slip lower still. So there you go. One of those opportunities maybe to run a trade out a little bit further. Or not, the market giving us a little bit of a reaction now to that trading range. I mentioned this on Friday, but very often the best way to handle a trading range is to allow the market to break out, look for that retest, and then look for evidence that the market is actually going to stay outside of that trading range. Ooh, got a little bit slow there on the draw. But this is what you're looking for. You're looking for the market to retest and then prove that it can stay outside of the trading range. A good opportunity maybe here for a second push entry, entering below this current low. You've got to give up a little bit, but the upshot is you can probably cover the trade a little tighter. I'm not sure I would go in that heavy to start.
Multiple retests are not unusual as well, and sometimes a very drawn out retest. So sometimes it may take an hour or so for the market to actually retest the market or that support zone. So it may take, it may develop quickly, it may take a long time. And here we are essentially retesting that level again. All right, let's put that on the shelf for now. We can't totally disregard Friday's rally. But it does appear as though we're getting a little bit of a bullish pushback after that early move lower. Well, the buyer's coming on strong now. Uh, we're through the trading band on the Eagle and right back into the heart of this trading range. So this breakout was not a legitimate breakout. In fact, it may have just served to produce a bigger trading range. We'll see how this goes. Sideways to market, it's always a little bit dicey. So we've got a trend change signal here on the Falcon. Note how the signal developed with a little bit of a gap here from the trend line. You'll notice that when those types of signals develop, you should anticipate the market to pull back and touch the trend line. So don't crowd your stops too much on this type of trade. That's not to say the market's not going to go higher from here, just that when the signal develops away from the line like that, sometimes you need to give it just a little bit more room. Okay, the Raptor working a cloud crossover signal. I don't have the signal just yet, just have the warning dots. And you know what? It's the kind of thing that, oh, there's the cloud crossover. Let's see if we get a second push. I was going to say we're so close to the high of the morning. It's the kind of trade that I would probably only consider if we can take out the, the high. All right, did they slip me again? No, not this time. I got a little bit more cooperation on the long side. We'll see if the buyers can follow through on that. Get up there. Okay. 
So if we can break above the 7018 zone, um, it should be close enough to hit the break even target, the break even trigger. Well, let's go, buyers. Well, not yet. There we go. So It'd be a good idea to bring your stops in probably below these lows if the market fails at this point. It's probably going to reverse and head lower. I'm going to bring my, well, there's the break even. I was going to say I'm going to bring my break even trigger in a couple of ticks. No need. Hey, look at that. Two for two. Hooray for us. Look at us go. Yay, team. <laughs> Anything else? We need a cheerleading squad. Give me an E. <laughs> oh, dear. Had a little bit too much sleep, maybe. Hey, way to go, Dan. Dan says Friday morning around 11.30. I took, I set up a trade on the Eagle off the cloud crossover, entered the trade with one contract. I then realized I had a lunch appointment and did not want to exit the trade, so I set my stop loss on the ATR, went to lunch. To my surprise, when I got back from lunch, my account just had 45 ticks. Best lunch I ever had. <laughs> Nicely done, Dan. Um, you know what? Adam would love that story. <laughs> you should just copy and paste that, send that along to Adam. He would love that. Trade Manager. It is a fantastic tool, no doubt about it. Adam always used to marvel how, um, way before we had a public trading room and we were in a private trading room, uh, there'd be times that I would set a trade and the dog would just be at me and I'd have to take her for a walk. And I'd say, okay, well, I'll be back in 20 minutes. I got to take the dog for a walk. And he couldn't believe that I would leave an open position. And I said, well, I got my profit orders. I got my stop losses. What more do I need? Okay, so now it seems as though we may have a little bit of a bullish bent. The market trying to get out the top end of this trading range now. We may have to adjust the definition of our trading range. Initially, it was like so. Now, it may develop to be more like this. We'll just have to stay with it for a little while and see how it develops. If it is a trading range, we're obviously back at the top end, and as such, 
sellers may try to push it back into that sideways range. Okay, the Raptor, a little counter now with a number two signal. Uh, the Hawk already producing a bunch of yellow bars. The Falcon trying to produce a, a trend change signal. And hear that number two signal now. It could be tradable. Uh, remember, though, your hard edge is your target. So this is looking a little bit more like a scalp. But the number two signals that are tend to be a little bit more reliable are those that follow a hard edge bounce. And so in other words, a number three signal that's struggling will produce a number two signal. Those tend to be a little bit more reliable. All right, so here now another soft edge cell. I'm not gonna get too crazy on the short side just yet, but uh, like I said, it, I can see a move back here to the hard edge being a feasible, feasible trade. I'll highlight it for you. I, like I said, I don't think I'm going to take it, but there it is. Come on, get down there. Maybe not yet. They're kind of catching their breath. They're going to give it another go. And at this point, it's probably a good idea to bring your stops in a little bit. At very least here, I think, to the 7018 zone. And there you go. You hit your break even and you got your target. Uh, Rick is asking, I noticed the thin green line kind of overlapped after the number one signal. Is that any kind of in indication for positive trade? I think you're talking about this thin green line right there. Um, 
let me highlight that for you. I get asked about this almost every morning, it seems like. These are the initial balance lines from Indicator Warehouse. And all they do, it's a it's an add-on indicator. So you can go to Indicator Warehouse, go to search, search initial balance lines or initial balance. And it will take you to this page. And it's a tool that allows you to highlight all kinds of lines, one of which happens to be opening range. So that's really what I use it for. You can use it to highlight more, but I just use it to highlight the opening range high and low. So you say your opening range, how long you want your opening range to be for. And uh, so for the first half hour of trading, it will highlight the high and low for me. Now, regarding your question, uh, is that some sort of indication as to an uptrend? Uh, well, yes and no. Okay, so the number one signal printed right here. It was a judgment call on my part. I could have certainly taken the signal on the hash mark, right? No problem there. Signal completes. It says, okay, we're ready to go. Go ahead, take your trade. But for the sake of a few ticks, I thought I would enter above the current high of the morning. So the current high of the morning right here at 7015, uh, technically 17, 7015 quarter. I thought I'd give it another tick and enter on the other side. And fortunately for me, uh, the market did go up enough to find my high probability profit target. So same thing, if I end up getting a signal, you know, around here, around 70, 20, half, I'll probably take the high of the morning into consideration and enter a little bit further, give up a couple of ticks to try to get uh, a more reliable entry, if that makes sense. All right, we are flipping back and forth. The Hawk here um, giving us some pretty good opportunities, especially on those first micro macro cross signals. So we had one here to the upside. We got the reverse here. Now we're going to produce another one to the upside. But I don't know, we don't really have much in the way of a trend yet, do we?
All right, well, this is how the other day shaped up, too. Took uh, about an hour out of the day to kind of pick a direction, and then once it did, watch out. So just kind of waiting. Very sideways, very quiet. Not what you expect really for a Monday. Uh, the seller's pushing a little bit here. Back now to the bottom end of the short-term trading range, and we're seeing some buying come back. A little bit of a bounce, which would be anticipated. Okay, we're going to get an early cloud crossover signal here on the Raptor. The Hawk uh, already producing the first micro macro cross, and the Falcon about to produce a trend change signal. So we've got a few opportunities to get on board here. Oh, shoot, Eric, you're going to wait too long again. 
Okay, I'm going to anticipate the falcon signal, and here too, you, I'm just going to give it a couple of ticks to enter on the other side of this current low. So there's the signal. You know what? It's it's a trade-off. Chances are, if I get to hit the signal, I'm probably going to get filled below the signal bar as well. So I don't know. Maybe it'd be easier just to take it on the hash mark. We'll see if I get any bearish follow through on this now. Not liking to see the buyers push back too hard. I want to see a little bit more bearish follow through. Come on. You can do it. Okay, I've got a few questions here, which I will get to in just a moment. So bear with me a second, folks. All right, if the sellers can push from here, it looks like we're going to get a late filter entry signal. Note how the uh, filter is out of sync. The trend line trying to change color, but it keeps coming back to the magenta. All right, if this bar finishes on the low, the filter will flip back and then we will have a completed late filter entry signal. And I think I'm going to start bringing my stops in a bit. tricky rolling my stops already <clears throat> I'm taking the chance here that the sellers are gonna hold the buyers off and push it through on this next move lower before they allow the buyers to get on the other side of those highs Got the squeeze on.
All right, last chance for the buyers, or the sellers. <laughs> well, last chance for both, really. Okay, got the break even. Come on. Come on, just a couple more ticks. I'm going to cover the trade a little tighter. Okay, well, didn't quite make the profit target, but it was profit at any rate. Market's floundering a little bit here. Okay, we got a couple of really good questions. Uh, first, I'll deal with John's question here. John asked, does the Falcon signal short or do the three Falcon signal short mean something? So I think what John's referring to is, you know, do we get, when we get multiple signals to sell, does that make it stronger? So I think he's looking here, one, two, three. Not necessarily. Um, a, very often a single signal shows you more momentum than a signal that keeps repeating. A signal that keeps repeating and not going anywhere. So for instance, um, well, this signal came rather late, but here's a trend change signal that's kind of standing on its own. And it had a little better follow through than this signal here that kept repeating. Uh, do I dismiss a signal because it keeps repeating? No. But I don't want to see too many signals uh, as that just tells you that there's a lack of momentum in the market. You're meeting the parameters. The programming is meeting the parameters for a signal, but you're not getting the follow through which either means you're going to need to run a wider stop or or you just got to wait, really. Uh, Rick asks, what are you thinking about a higher probability trade? What factors do you think about? Or when you are thinking about a high probability trade, what factors do you think about? Your greatest challenge as a trader is going to be identifying trend. When you're looking at taking a trade, you're never going to have all the pieces to the puzzle. Taking a trade is always a little bit of a leap of faith. <laughs> Actually, maybe not so little. <clears throat> there is always going to be unknown factors. So what I'm thinking about is who is controlling the market? If I think the buyers are in control, then I'll look to buy. If I think the sellers are in control, I'll look to sell. How can I tell if the buyers are in control? Well, one way is to just look at what's happened before. And what I'm talking about now is Friday's session. And the buyer's obviously in control on Friday. Like, just look at that that day. Sure, the market spent some time bouncing around, but it was a strong day, right? Look at that. Huge rally day. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking we've still got a pretty strong buyer's market. So when I'm looking at um, a signal to buy, I may favor it a little bit over a sell signal. Um, the other thing I'm always thinking about is a stop placement. Where do I need to place my stop in order to make the trade work? 
and actually before I get into stop placement, mark, market context. So this is kind of on the heels of what I was just talking about. Okay, the overall trend is up, but for the last three or four hours, the market has been very, very sideways. All right, so while the overall context is up, uh, the current market trend is non-existent. So now when I'm looking at a trade, it comes to, well, where am I going to place my stop loss if I'm going to make this trade work? If I'm going to take it on the hash mark, uh, I pretty much committed to risking it below the bottom end of the trading range. If that looks reasonable to me, then I hit the submit button and away I go. If I look at this and I say, well, I don't know, the market's kind of been going sideways, maybe we're at the top end of the trading range, maybe it's going to bounce. Well, then I'll wait for the second push opportunity. I'll allow the signal to engage. I'll see where the market reacts. Now, sometimes this will fool you, right? Sometimes the market will just go boom, 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 higher without you. And it's like, well, okay, well, I guess wrong. The nice idea about a second push opportunity is you can usually get by with a tighter stop. With this particular market context, I probably would not be going in with two contracts either. Take us to where we are this morning. And on the first trade I did, we saw the market fall off early. And uh, I tried this one because it was early, tried to get some early momentum, uh, which paid off. And then the market flinches and tries to resume the uptrend. Well, look at what happened. We've pretty much recovered the entire downtrend, right? So now I'm thinking, the buyers have control. So my initial bearish bias flipped and now I'm thinking the buyers have control. So now it, I've deemed the, the buyers are in control. How do I set up this trade? Well, I chose to enter above the high, the current high of the morning. You could have entered here. Um, and now again, it becomes a matter of logistics. Where do I place my stop that I'm not going to get stopped out prematurely? Well, the best stop placement is down there. It's probably not feasible, so I, I went mid-range. And then fortunately, the, the market continued higher to my profit target. Uh, the next signal, This one here, which I didn't take, but did work out. If the buyers have control of the market, prices should be going up. Right? We saw a little breakout here above the high of the morning, and we gained, you know, four or five points, and then nothing. The market shouldn't do that. If the market is bullish, we should see this kind of thing, right? We should see prices advancing, but it, it wasn't. That's why I said, okay, well, here's a number two signal. That is an opportunity to short. Uh, your target is the hard edge. It's a little iffy because we just had a bullish breakout. The market may just be retesting the breakout which is why I chose not to take the trade, even though it did work out and the market slips back into the sideways trading range. Then here we are going back and forth, and now we get an opportunity to sell again. Note the lower highs. I always say whoever controls the last swing controls the market. Well, here the sellers controlled the last swing, the buyers tried to control the swing here, which makes sense. 
but then the sellers took it away again, and then we came back with another selling opportunity. I had to sweat it a little bit, but it did get down. And now here come the buyers and the sellers again. So we've got ourselves, the context of this market is sideways to down. We definitely have a downward bent, but it's struggling, right? So those are the kinds of things that are going through my head when I'm trying to decipher a signal. Uh, first off, what is the trend? Secondly, what is the context? Where do I need to place my stop in order to make this trade work? Like here on this number three signal, uh, there's no point in waiting for a second push entry on this signal. Why? Well, because, you know, every bar that ticks by, I'm getting closer to the support zone where I know there's buying. This bar obviously gave me a second push, but look at how I need to enter. Then we come back down here to the lows and there's a reaction and now I'm sweating the trade. This is the kind of trade where if you're gonna take it, the hard edge bounce, you may as well take it on the hash mark because at least once the market goes down a little bit, you get some room to manage your trade. So I hope that makes sense. You have to try to think in terms of probabilities. What, how can I set up this trade so I have the highest probability of success? And sometimes you're gonna look at a trade and it's going to say, no, I don't think I can skew the probabilities in my favor here. Either it's going to demand too much of a stop loss or the market just looks too sideways or, you know, it just won't have all the elements to it. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just wait it out. Remember, we're not looking for a lot of signals. We're just looking for signals that we deem to be reliable. Uh, Ron asked, uh, good morning, Eric. Well, good morning, Ron. With a $5,000 account with the Raptor, shouldn't I fill in the strategy window on the account size, that amount, when I'm ready to go live? And should I do anything to make sure I'm trading one contract at a time? I'm only trading the NASDAQ, Russell, 6E, 6J, 6B, and 6A. Okay, Ron. So what Ron is asking... When you go here to your strategies window, now remember, before you make any changes here, you're going to have to turn your Raptor off, but he's talking about up here, account balance. Um, normally, you don't need to fill that in because the Raptor will pick up your balance from your account. You're going to pull down your account here. And this will have your account number on it. For the odd times where the programming cannot access your account balance, then yes, you're going to have to enter the amount up here. But this is more of a fail safe. So no, you shouldn't need to worry about that. Now, Ron, please don't take offense, but I think you're trading too many contracts for a small, or too many markets for a smaller account. Um, you're looking at, you know, six markets, following six markets, 
that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, I can barely keep track of three. I'm only watching the NASDAQ, the Russell, and crude oil. And 90% of my attention is on the NASDAQ. I'm not sure how you can follow those six markets at one time. And this kind of brings me back to the notion that you don't need to trade a lot to be successful trader. In fact, trading often tends to have the exact opposite effect on your trading success. If uh, the math doesn't lie, folks, and I apologize that I kind of get up on my soapbox and keep hammering this one home, but or trying to hammer this one home. <clears throat> But if you trade just twice a day for $50, just twice a day, two trades, 50 bucks, or one trade for 100, whichever you deem easier. If you can do that day in and day out, you will make $20,000 a year trading single contract. If you can do that, after that, it becomes a numbers game. If you can do it with one contract, well, you can do it with two. That's 40000 You can do it with four. That's 80000 You can do it with 10. That's 200000 So the people that are making $200,000 a year trading are not necessarily trading more often. But what they are doing is they are increasing their position size. So even here this morning on the Hawk, you can see we've had multiple signals. And I pick on the Hawk because, of, of course, it's the scalping tool. You can do this with the Raptor as well. But if we focus just on the first micro macro cross, you can see not even 10 minutes into the day, I got my $250 trades. My day is done. What I'm afraid of for you is that by following so many markets, especially a market like the Russell, the 6A, even the British pound can be kind of brutal. Um, you know, the Russell is a great market. It, it can be a great trending market, but you're also trading at $10 a tick, which is going to demand more risk from you versus a market like the NASDAQ or the mini Dow. So I, I think you should get yourself into a, a quota mindset where you're only looking to take two, maybe three trades a day and no more. I think you should have a, a stop loss limit on your day. Um, typically for me, it's 5% of my capital. So if I blow up 5% of my capital, I don't trade anymore that day. You know, at the end of the day, folks, it's your money. I can tell you what I think, but it's your decision, right? Oh, I love Rick's question here. Rick asks, this is tricky to me. How can I figure out what the market is going to do? You can't. <laughs> you can't. I'm sorry to burst that bubble for you. You can't. If anybody tells you that they can, they're lying. I don't care if you are Paul Tudor Jones or Ed Sequoia or one of these other famous traders. You cannot figure out where the market's going to go next. We all have our best guess, but nobody, and I do mean nobody, knows where the market is going to go next. The best way, uh, like I said, is you need to try to decipher the trend. You have three choices. The market can be going up 
It can go, be going down or it can be going sideways. If you look at a chart and you cannot figure out if the market is going up or if it is going down, I guarantee you it is going sideways. Sideways markets are going to be very difficult to trade. Unfortunately, sideways markets are also what we tend to see the most often. When a market is moving sideways, it's going to establish a sideways range. And there's going to be selling at the top end of the range. There's going to be buying at the bottom end of the range. And the middle of the range is pretty much no man's land. So you're either going to have to wait for it to break out of here and show you that it can stay out. And likewise to the downside, look for the breakout. Look for evidence that it can stay out. Or um, you're just going to, you know, you're going to have to look at who controls the last swing of the market. So right now we are seeing a, a bullish swing, right? The buyers bought in here, rallied the market. So if it looks like the buyers are controlling the market, well, we produced a number two signal here. We've produced another number two signal here. I would probably be ignoring the number three signals because of the number two, uh, because of the swing right here. So now the, the sellers are pushing back, right? We've got a lower bar relative to this one. What's going to happen next? Well, the market's gonna try to come down here again if the buyers can control the market, it will turn once more and come back up, and that will produce a number one signal. That will be our cloud crossover signal. At that point, you need uh, to make a decision. If you're going to try the trade, you know, you have to set it up to give yourself a chance, which will usually mean a little bit of a bigger stop at least to start. Um, if you don't think the market is going to push higher, then just wait. Wait for more evidence that maybe a trend is developing. Well, I did miss um, I did miss part of Ron's question. Ron asked, "How can I make sure I'm only trading one contract at a time?" Ron, go here, click on your risk percent module, and it will flip to manual mode. This box will lighten up and uh, that's where you set your quantity so now you will always trade just a single contract no matter where you place your stops it will always just be one contract all right so that's manual mode yeah rick says find trend and reliable signals and that's that's really it if if you can determine the trend, uh, then you can wait for the system to produce a signal. Like we can anticipate the signals because we're getting warning dots, right? And then you need to think, okay, how can I set this up that perhaps I can ensure I'm on the right side of the market? Well, usually it's going to mean Okay, well, let's say I, I choose to enter above there. Even if the number one signal prints around here somewhere, maybe I'm gonna to choose to enter above the high. And the fact is I'm gonna need a bigger stop. There's always a, a probability exchange based on your stop loss. The bigger your stop loss, the greater the chance of success. The tighter your stop loss, the lower the chance of success. Um, you do need to spend some time with your charts. You do need to gain some confidence in your signals. An easy way to do it is just to grab your 
scroll bar and just scroll back randomly and stop. And then analyze your signals when you get them. So here's a number one signal. And then just play the game. Is this a signal I would take? Yes, all right. Why? See if you can identify the reasons why. And it better not be because this arrow is pointing up over here. In fact, you can turn those off by going to your indicator window, finding your Raptor 2.0. Scroll down here to the bottom, arrow location. You can go to do not plot so that you can't cheat. But you should look at this and you should see if you can determine two reasons for taking the trade. Well, reason number one, okay, it's a, it's a hard edge bounce. It's a, a continuation signal. Reason number two, it looks like we have an uptrend. All right, so I'll take the trade. Now you need to decide, am I going to take it on the hash mark? Am I going to wait for a second push? Okay, let's say I'm going to take it on the hash mark. Why? Well, because I don't want to run into this resistance. I don't want to run into this resistance. Therefore, logistically, it will make more sense for me to get into the trade earlier. Maybe I can manage my trade sooner. Okay, good. Good reasons. Where am I going to place my stop loss? Uh, okay, well, Eric always says place stops two swings back. There's swing one, there's swing two. Um, no, that's not swing one, that's not swing two. All three of these swings are more or less the same price level. That is swing one, and down here or here is swing two. If I can afford it, I'll place my stop down there to start. And now you play it forward. How does my trade do? Oh, okay, bar against me. Now you make the decision, what do I do? Because you know what, folks? When you're trading real money, these are the exact decisions you have to make. And you don't have the luxury of scrolling ahead to see if the trade actually works out. So let's say you decide to tough it out. You decide to hang in a little bit longer because you have confidence in the emerging trend. All right, and there we go. The market starts advancing. And we're up, and so far so good. Oh, okay, now another reverse bar. Now what do I do, right? And this is how you learn to trade. We can develop all the programming in the world to prompt you when is a good time to get in. But it's as though, you know, I put you behind the wheel of a, of a, F, a Formula One race car. Sure, you know how to drive, but you probably can't drive a Formula One race car because right? it's got like 600 horsepower and you're used to driving your, your Prius. <laughs> so you have to learn how, how the tools work. Um, it just like, you know, I can think of other tool analogies as well, but it's, it's the same kind of deal. And this is an easy way to learn. It's a free way to learn, but don't, don't cheat yourself. Okay. Let's say you, you choose to let the market move another bar against you. Okay. Well, there it is. You know, the decision remains the same. Maybe at this point you say, well, all right, time to roll my stops up. I'll put my stops below here and I'll let it ride. And if the trade works out, great. If it doesn't work out, well, I've taken, it looks like about a $200 stop or a $170 stop. So if this stop down here was 2% of your capital and the market comes down and wipe, hits your stop loss, you've effectively lost about 1% or uh, three quarters of a percent of your trading capital. Okay, so the trade didn't work out. These are not the kind of trades that are going to ruin you. Right? The kind of trades that are going to ruin you are the trades where you, and I, I worked with a fellow who would do this. He would risk six contracts every single trade. I could not get it through his head 
that he was risking too much money. And then he would strangle his trades and he would put his stops in ultra, ultra tight. And the market would fill them and bring them in and stop them out and only go up without them. And I still remember he phoned me, this is a couple, three years ago now. He said, we, he was trading gold. He says, Eric, I, I just lost like $800 trading gold. And I said, how can you lose $800? I just made 1000 We're trading the exact same market. He loses 800 I made 1000 Why did that happen? Well, you can see why that happened. He risked more than he can afford to lose. He kept his stops too tight. The market stopped him out before he even had a chance to realize his profit. Like, folks, this is trading. The market, unfortunately, is not going to make a beeline to your profit target. You're going to sweat the trade a little bit. This is what you're getting paid to do now. <laughs> and I'm sorry if I sound a little flippant, but, you know, people come into trading and they think, oh, well, you know, this is, there's nothing to this. Yeah, there is a little bit to it. You have to, you have to kind of stand back and, like I said, analyze the market, see what seems to be going on. See here, we still have this sideways to down drift. Does that mean I should take buy signals? No, probably not, because since the open, we've kind of been moving lower, haven't we? So we'll be favoring sell signals. Here comes another one. This is kind of like your follow-up signal to your number one signal here. Um, is the market going to beeline lower? No, probably not. It's probably going to continue to grind. I think it will go lower from here. So, you know, we can set up the trade. Here's a second push opportunity. We're at the low of the morning. So if the market breaks the low of the morning, it's probably gonna stop out a few of the, the buyers that bought near the low or at the low. But here too, the stop can't be overly tight because look at the swings. We've had like 14 point swings in the market. So, Chances are, if your stop is within 14 points of your entry, that's points, not ticks. Uh, there's a chance that you could get tagged out. So I, I hope that makes some sense. Uh, Scott asks, uh, hi, Eric, can you review the buy and buy limit differences again? Sure. So we have four uh, orders to choose from. The stop, which is the one I tend to favor. We have a limit order, we have a stop limit, and we have a market. Market is pretty much self-explanatory. You buy at whatever the current price is. Uh, then we have our limit and stop limit. So limit orders are based on trying to pick up on reversals. Um, stock traders are always stuck on doing limit orders because you use them so often in the stock market. A limit order always has to be above um, or below. Okay. One second. If you're looking to buy, the limit order has to be below. If you're looking to sell, the limit order has to be above. So let's say I want to sell this market on a limit, and I think I'll say, okay, if the market comes back to 6697, I will sell it. So when it trades up here to 66.97, I will be short. The nice thing about a limit order is you can tend to keep your stops relatively tight because you're looking to catch this little hiccup, right? And that's what you're looking to take advantage of. A buy limit order or a stop limit order 
will default to this value here. The idea behind a stop limit is that you limit the number of ticks you are slipped. So if I look to short the market here, I have a one tick stop limit. If I increase that to say four, you can see now I have a four tick spread that I can get filled on. This is usually just an issue in really fast or really thin markets. I was dealing with a fellow who was trading crude oil and he was getting slipped eight ticks on his entry, $80 on his entry. And I said, you'd better have a talk with your broker because an eight tick slip is insane. Slippage is not usually an issue if the market is liquid enough, but if you want to eliminate your slippage or limit your slippage, you would use the stop limit orders. And you can limit your slippage to one or two ticks. If the market is moving really, really fast, however, and you're using a stop limit and the market gaps you, you may not get filled. So you may have been right about the trade, but you may not have gotten filled because of your stop limit. But like I say, if the market is reasonably liquid, like the NASDAQ or any of the common markets, it won't be an issue. That's a good uh, good question, Ron. Ron says, I thought the Russell was uh, was $5 a tick. Truth be told, uh, Ron, I haven't paid much attention to the Russell since they moved it over to the CME. I know that's bad. Uh, let me just see if I can find it. If the Russell is $5 a tick, then yeah, by all means, it's, um, go with it. I can't believe all the hype about the uh, Bitcoin either, but <laughs> what do I know? Oh yeah, it is. It's five. Okay, well that makes it much, much more palatable. The, the thing with watching so many markets is it's hard. It's hard to watch a lot of markets. It's hard to stay sharp, you know, when you're flipping back and forth between NASDAQ and Russell and crude and gold and the euro and the pound and the yen. Some markets aren't going to be very active at certain times of the day anyhow, like the euro and the British pound will be closing down now. This, uh, the Aussie dollar and the yen are going to be pretty flat right now because it's off times for Japan and Australia. The uh, the Russell, the Nasdaq, the E mini, the bond markets, the gold market, those tend to be most active during the North American sessions, of course, because those are native to this time zone. Yeah, Dan says always in the market is key or always in the context of the market is key and it's so true and it's difficult to determine sometimes uh, that's why i will occasionally reference 
you know, like a daily chart or even a time-based chart. Like you can throw uh, like a 15 minute chart up. You can see, sometimes that will show you a little bit more plainly what is the trend. Uh, right now, the current trend does seem to be down. So maybe I'll have a little bit more of a bearish bias on the day. You, you can see there's, there is buying going on. Take a look at this candle right here, super long tail. So there was aggressive selling and then aggressive buying. But now we have some aggressive selling again. But just the overall slant. And if you can't decipher that, then you can always go to a, a line chart. You'll have to change either your background color or your line color. Well, let's make it a pretty red. And, you know, same thing. It looks like the direction is down. Oops, now I messed things up. And like I said, sometimes it's no easy thing to try to figure out what the what the trend is. Sometimes you're going to be just left scratching your head. And, you know, like I said, sometimes it's helpful to reference a time-based chart or just, uh, or here, if you only have the Raptor, uh, scrunch up your chart a little bit or do another Raptor chart at a, a higher tick value, maybe throw a, a 15 tick or a 20 tick chart up. But you can also scrunch up your chart like this and see if you can get an idea as to which way the market is leaning. Oh, you do that by holding the control key and hitting your up and down arrows. That will adjust your, your um, the number of bars you have displayed. If you don't remember that, this little pencil here will tell you everything you need to know. Uh, it's on here somewhere. Or it used to be. Oh, sorry. The one beside the pencil, the bar style. So bar spacing, you want it closer together, further apart. Fatter bars, thinner bars. There you go. <laughs> okay, Tom. You can tell I don't follow uh, Formula One racing that closely. Tom says, uh, slightly off topic, Eric, but Formula One cars run about 1,200 horsepower from a two-liter engine. <laughs> I was just watching something last night about racing, and so I pulled out a racing analogy. Sorry, it wasn't a very good one. <laughs> uh, Scott says, ultimate support resistance hit 69.81 half and turned. So impressive. I know. Isn't it great? My, my babies. It, it does amaze me how very often it will hit the line on the number and then turn but you should refrain from using it exactly rather consider it a zone or an area of price sensitivity occasionally you can see the market will drift through a little bit yeah uh, and on the Similar note, Dan says here on the support and resistance suite, we're below the median line and we're drifting lower. So that would, uh, good point, Dan, because the median line does tend to give you a bias on the day. If prices are trading below the median line, we're going to tend to be a little bit more bearish. 
Certainly once we're below the primary support line, that first blue line below the median line, we can expect the market to be uh, a little bit more bearish overall. And that's kind of what we've been looking at so far. A slow slide. A slow push lower. Okay, I think I got everybody's question. If not, shoot me a note. Definitely a downward bent so far, though. So I'll favor shorting opportunities. So here now, the hard edge sell on the Raptor. So we have a chance to get short. Did they slip me again? Look at that. I'm getting slipped all the time here this morning. What's with that? Why is the NASDAQ so thin today? That's not right. Uh, Beard asked Eric a few minutes ago, I was short with one contract with a $75 target. When it reached the target, the order canceled instead of filling. Not sure why. Um, it, it probably, if it reached your target, it did fill. And then you heard order canceled. And what it was canceling was your stop loss order. So if you check your P&L, uh, I bet you you've got a $75 profit. So if you turn your PL on, I bet you have a profitable trade. Because your trade manager will do that when it your either your stop loss fills or your profit target fills, the other order will cancel. So that's what you're hearing. Rick asks, maybe it wants to go long, but needs to retrace from Friday some. You know what, uh, Rick? I've given up a long time ago trying to second guess what the market's going to do. I think as a trader, we need to be more reactive than predictive. It's not to say we're always going to get it right, but... Uh, trying to predict what the market will do next is probably a surefire way to get it wrong. All right, we seeing some really strong bullishness come into the market now. We're back into the hard edge. This is where we're going to anticipate a reaction. Okay, so we're getting some selling.
Seller's got to step up in a big way here. Because that was a pretty serious bullish rally. Bigger than I thought it was going to be. Well, the buyers, the buyers mounting a bit of a comeback. All right, gang, uh, we're probably going to button up shop here shortly. If anybody has any questions, please ask away. Otherwise, we're going to call it a morning. Uh, Rick is, says, I'm thinking Friday was long. Now it's going sideways after the highs. Uh, it quite possibly, what markets have a tendency to do, it used to be that if the market had a good rally day, the next day would be a good rally day as well. But now what tends to happen is we get a rally day and then maybe one or two or even three sideways days, and then the market will either rally higher or lower again. All right, so it's not uncommon to see the market fall flat after a big rally day. That's just kind of the, the way things going now. All right, gang, uh, I'm gonna try to nurse this trade at least to a break even uh, if they allow it. And I will, if you're gonna trade this afternoon, like I said, we still have a little bit of a bearish bent on the day, uh, but, uh, a little bit of a pullback, maybe as high as, where's my next resistance line? Well, maybe even back to the primary, not unreasonable to assume. But so far, it looks like we've got a slow grind lower and a bit of a sideways kind of day to boot. All right, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye for now.